Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. Join me for in-depth discussions of the Outlander book series by Diana Gabaldon, the television series, and anything interesting that falls between. This is podcast episode 148. We are in week 33 of the Drums of Autumn read-along, and this episode is titled Cowards Need Not Apply. And the summary goes something like this. Claire was annoyed with the rascally rabbits. Roger made his return. He performed a blood vow upon the baby. Jamie declared Roger and Brianna husband and wife by hand fast. Brianna was timid around Roger. Claire tended Roger's wounded foot. Roger convalesced at the partially completed big house. Brianna visited Roger regularly. Claire released Roger from rest. Claire cautioned Roger to be careful. Jamie cautioned Roger not to be cowardly. Roger went to see Brianna. They talked and began their way back to each other. Inside the Chapters, Chapter 66, Child of My Blood. Claire was in the vegetable garden, decrying the work of hungry and destructive rabbits. She found herself missing young Ian and his dog. She was trying to get the new planting in before the weather turned cold. She needed a way to keep the rabbits from the nutrient-dense and flavorful cabbages. She decided Jamie should urinate, like a mountain lion, around the garden to keep the hungry bunnies away. She headed toward the herb shed and noticed movement. She thought it was Jamie, but it was a man dark of hair and beard, in tattered clothing, looking worse for wear. It was Roger Mackenzie Wakefield. He was happy Claire was the person he first met. Your foot, Roger. It does not matter. He gripped my arm. Are they all right? The baby and Brianna. They're fine. Everybody's in the house. You have a son. He jerked sharply back toward me, green eyes wide with startlement. He's mine? I have a son? I suppose you do. I said, you're here, aren't you? The look of startlement and hope I realized faded slowly. He looked into my eyes and seemed to see how I felt, for he smiled. Not easily. No more than a painful lifting of the corner of his mouth. But he smiled. I'm here, he said, and turned toward the cabin and its open doorway. The others were in the cabin. Jamie and Brianna worked on the house plans. While the baby slept nearby, Lizzie was busy spinning by the window. With the opening of the door, Jamie swiftly and loudly reacted before recognizing who it was who had entered. Brianna looked around wildly as she soothed the woken baby. Jamie stood with the stillness of battle readiness next to Brianna as she nursed the baby. Roger's own countenance echoed that of Jamie. They appeared to mirror each other to Claire's shock. They were Vikings, the pair of them, with Brianna rounding at the trio with flames in her eyes. Roger asked Jamie, cut his wrist. I don't imagine it pleases you any more than it does me, he said in his rusty voice. But you are my nearest kinsman. Cut me. I've come to swear an oath in our shared blood. To my surprise, Roger didn't look at Brianna or reach for her hand. Instead, he swiped his thumb across his bleeding wrist and stepped close to her, eyes on the baby. She pulled back instinctively, but Jamie's hand came down on her shoulder. Roger knelt in front of her and, reaching out, pushed the shawl aside and smeared a broad red cross upon the downy curve of the baby's forehead. "'You're blood of my blood,' he said softly, "'and bone of my bone. I claim thee as my son before all men, from this day forever.' He looked up at Jamie challenging. After a long moment, Jamie gave the slightest nod of acknowledgement and stepped back letting his hand fall from Brianna's shoulder. In that one act, Roger adopted the baby as his. He asked what the baby was named, but he has yet to have one. 
Claire saw how different Brianna and Roger were to each other. It had been nine plus months since they'd become hand fast. Roger wanted to know if Brianna was his wife. He's my son. Are you my wife? Brianna had gone pale to the lips. I don't know. This man says that you are hand fast. Jamie took a step closer to her, watching Roger. Is that true? We, we were. We still are. Roger took a deep breath. Very well then, he said, calling the meeting to order. If you're hand fast, Brianna, then you're married, and this man is your husband. Brianna's flush deepened, but she looked at Roger, not Jamie. You said hand fasting was good for a year and a day. And you said you did not want anything temporary. She flinched at that, but then set her lips firmly. I didn't, but I didn't know what was going to happen. She glanced at me and Jamie, then back at Roger. They told you that the baby isn't yours? Roger raised his eyebrows. Oh, but he is mine, hmm? He lifted his bandaged wrist in illustration. Brianna's face had lost its frostbitten look. She was pink around the edges. You know what I mean. I know what you mean, he said softly. I'm sorry for it. It was... It wasn't your fault. Roger glanced at Jamie. I... It was. I should have stayed with you, seen you safe. Brianna's brows drew together. I told you to go and I meant it. She twitched her shoulders impatiently. But it doesn't matter now. Brianna wanted to know why he came back. Maybe for obligation and wanting, but he couldn't tell her exactly. She asked him about the stone circle. It took him a long time to find it again. She explained to Roger what she wanted from a marriage. You did go back, but you can. Maybe you should. She looked at him straight on, her gaze the twin of her father's. I don't want to live with you if you came back for duty. She looked at me then, her eyes soft with pain. I've seen a marriage made from obligation, and I've seen one made for love. If I hadn't... She stopped and swallowed, then went on looking at Roger. If I hadn't seen both, I could have lived with obligation, but I have seen both, and I won't. I felt as though someone had struck me in the breastbone. My marriages, she meant. I looked for Jamie and found him looking at me with the same expression of shock I knew was on my own face. He coughed to break the silence and cleared his throat, turning to Roger. They were handfast on September 2nd of the prior year. For two and a half months, they would remain so then they could choose to stay together or not. Well, Monian, if you're handfast with this man, then you're bound to him. There is no question. He turned and gave Roger a dark blue stare. So you'll live here as her husband? And on September the 3rd, she will choose whether she'll wed you by priest and book or whether you'll leave and trouble her no more. You have that long to decide why you're here and convince her of it. You'll live here as her husband, I said, but if you touch her unwilling, I'll cut your heart out and feed it to the pig. You understand me? <laughs> The last remark, or rather, threat, caused a row between the two men after they went outside. Treat her badly and I'll rip your balls off and cram them down your throat, Jamie's voice said softly in Gaelic. I glanced at Brianna and saw that her mastery of Gaelic was sufficient to have appreciated the gist of this. Her mouth opened, but she didn't get a word out. There was the sound of a quick scuffle outside, ending in an even louder thump, as of a head striking logs. Roger didn't have Jamie's air of quiet menace, but his, 
His voice rang with sincerity. Lay your hands on me once more, you fucking sod, and I'll stuff your head back up your arse where it came from. <laughs> oh, that makes me laugh. Jamie is going to test Roger 100% along the way. Like, he doesn't have a choice. And Jamie's not used to having a man, another man as, lo as large as him nearly. I mean, what, Roger's supposed to be 6'3", and Jamie's 6'4". They're big men. I mean, Roger comes from the Mackenzie stock as well. And there's going to be this, like, wild pissing contest on everything that men are wont to do. As ever, Claire attributed it to testosterone poisoning. Can you do anything about it? Well, there are only two things they do with it, and one of them is to try to kill each other. Brianna rubbed her nose. Uh-huh, she said. And the other? Our eyes met with a perfect understanding. I'll take care of your father, I said. But Roger's up to you. <laughs> Claire, if it were only so easy to take care of testosterone poisoning. <laughs> but that is about the only thing that they do with it. You're right. Life on the Ridge was uncomfortable with the personalities and situations at play. The baby's nightly colic caused Jamie to work on the new house with fervor. Roger helped with the other chores. Though his injured foot made it difficult. He refused treatment, but Claire insisted he must allow her to assess it. There were no signs of blood infection or gangrene. There were pockets of infection that built up and had been partially draining when he walked. She decided what to do and needed Bree's help. Lizzie offered in her place, out of remorsefulness, and trying to make amends any way she could for her part in Roger's trial. Claire bid Lizzie the task of taking the baby outside for some fresh air. Claire explained the procedure of draining, disinfecting, and debridement to Roger. She had Brianna hold onto his hands tightly. By the time she had disinfected the wound, Roger's head was in Brianna's lap and her arms were tight around his shoulders. Claire went to the shed for a minute to get the rotting meat she had prepped a couple of days before. So she'd been thinking through what this possibly could be and why the infection hadn't been worse. Because she didn't really get to look at it that deeply when they were still at the Mohawk camp, right? And she didn't have tools with her and all of those things. That She placed the maggots into the wounds to eat away any dead tissue that remained. She had learned this type of debridement from her friend, Naya Winnie. Well, because if she would have actually gone in and surgically debrided it, she would have had to cut his foot open a lot more and think she would have disfigured him if she would have had to cut away, scrape away all that skin. So this way, you put the maggots in, and I did put a link into the show notes. She put the maggots into the tissue, and they only eat dead meat. So they would eat it and either crawl out if they had not turned into flies yet, or they would just turn into flies and fly away. Very cool. Kind of funky. Interestingly, mid-last century, just before, when antibiotics really started being used greatly and widely, this practice went out of style. But fast forward, what, 70 years? And maggots are being used again in the hospital clinic and clinical environments because of antibiotic resistance. So they're coming back in, and there's even um, some research being done on the enzyme from the maggots to be used, to be actually made at the pharmacological level, but it's pretty far off. Anyway, it's a really interesting link that explains this in detail, but this is what tried and true techniques. It works. And we can't always rely on things that 
are modern marvels. I mean, antibiotics started waning their greatness maybe 25 years, 25? No, not 25. About 45 years into use, they weren't so spectacular anymore, and things were already showing up that they wouldn't help with. So uh, we in the West, man, we just like to go full bore and... <laughs> We just want our magnificence to shine, but there are limitations to everything that we do. So throwing out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, and throwing out all the things that came before is not a good thing. So there are going to have to be skills that are relearned. Just like when Claire goes back to the 18th century, she has to learn this more skills. She has to learn more about herbs and about how to do things naturally because she doesn't have all the modern conveniences and devices to lean on for it. She wrapped his foot and assured him the work of the maggots might tickle, but they wouldn't hurt. And it's uh, called maggot therapy. <laughs> That's the actual name now. So you can't have antibiotic therapy sometimes, but you can have maggot therapy. So there you have it. Claire went outside to wash the bowl. She met Jamie, who was holding the baby. He had taken him from a crying Lizzie, who was mourning the loss of young Ian. Now, this girl is going to get bored crazy soon. Jamie took Claire to show her of his progress on the big house. He thought Roger staying at the big house temporarily would be the best bet since beds were in short supply and the cabin was small. They talked and Claire told Jamie, Brianna and Roger are getting to know each other again. And things seemed well between them. Clever Claire had Brianna help her with Roger's procedure. Brianna had to touch Roger and be near him. And why, oh why, did Jamie still think poorly of Roger? Testing, testing, testing him. I haven't puzzled that one fully out yet. And Lizzie, damn that girl, should feel all sorts of remorsefulness. Though, Jamie going full tilt, Operation Wakefield is a rapist, is all on his shoulders 100%. <laughs> There's so much going on here. And I do think, as somebody has commented before, that perhaps Jamie has some jealousy. He hasn't had Brianna that long, and now in comes this interloper. He was wrong for what he did, but he did it for all the right reasons. In his mind, and he and Young Ian said they would do it again. Really? You're not going to corroborate the story? You're not going to get your facts? You're not going to ask what the man looked like? Yeah. I'm still not keen on the fact that they kept using the name Wakefield instead of Mackenzie, because that's what he used in front of Brianna, just like she's using Fraser. So, anywho, we're past that part. <laughs> Chapter 67, The Toss of a Coin Roger was staying in the partially built big house while recovering from having Claire perform minor surgery on him. Brianna came to see him every day to bring food, water, and such. She had come without the baby today, and he thought it was wonderful to have the rare alone time with her. She didn't stay long because of the baby's absence, though. Roger's appetite had come back with ferocity. He gratefully ate what she had brought him in the basket. As he ate, Roger looked out over the land, understanding and approving of Jamie's selecting this site for the house. Fraser had known what he was about when he'd chosen the site of this house. It commanded the entire slope of the mountain, with a view that ran to the distant river and beyond— with mist-filled valleys in the distance and dark peaks that touched a star-strewn sky. It was one of the most solitary, magnificent, heart-wrenchingly romantic spots he had ever seen. And Brianna was down below nursing a small bald parasite while he was here, alone with a few dozen of his own. <laughs> oh, Roger. Roger pondered why he told her. He didn't know why we, he returned. He hadn't known then. He knew now. 
He'd come back because he couldn't live on the other side, if it were guilt over abandoning them, or the simple knowledge that he would die without her, either or both. Take your choice. He knew what he was giving up, and none of it bloody mattered. He had to be here, that was all. How to tell her that so she would believe it? Christ, she was so jumpy that she barely let him touch her. A brush of lips, a touch of hands, and she was sidling away, except for the day when she'd held him while Claire had tortured his foot. Then she'd been truly there for him, hanging on with all her strength. He could still feel her arms around him, and the memory gave him a small thump of satisfaction in the pit of his stomach. The jig was up. He figured out and appreciated Claire's tactic in getting Brianna in proximity proximity to and touching him in performing the wound surgery. There's our clever Claire. At the end of the week, Claire released him from recovery and cautioned him to not step on anything sharp. The baby had been crying all night, so no one got any sleep. Jamie planned on moving into the partially built house with Claire immediately. Roger took this moment to ask Claire's advice about what to do based on Brianna's behavior when he tried to touch her. Claire indelicately approached the subject. You were her first, weren't you? The first man she slept with, I mean? He felt the blood rising. His cheeks. I, ah, uh, yes. Well then, so far, her entire experiences of what one might call the delights of sex consists of being deflowered, and I don't care how gentle you were about it, it tends to hurt, being raped two days later, then giving birth. You think this is calculated to make her fall swooning into your arms in anticipation of your reclaiming your marital rights? You asked for it, he thought, and you got it, right between the eyes. His cheeks burned hotter than they ever had with fever. I never thought of that, he muttered to the wall. Well, naturally not, she said, sounding torn between exasperation and amusement. You're a bloody man. That's why I'm telling you. He took a deep breath and reluctantly turned back to face her. And just what are you telling me? That she's afraid, she said. She cocked her head to one side, evaluating him. Though it's not you she's afraid of, by the way. It's not? No, she said bluntly. She may have convinced herself that she has to know why you came back, but that's not it. A regiment of blind men could see that. It's that she's afraid she won't be able to... Mm-hmm. She raised one brow at him, encompassing... A wealth of indelicate suggestion... I see, he said, taking a deep breath. And just what do you suggest I do about it? So Claire tells him that he should be careful. After Claire left, Jamie came bearing gifts of a razor and hot water. Roger was thankful as the beard itched terribly. Roger tried to make small talk as Jamie watched him shave. There was little use for a historian with the talent as a folk singer on an 18th century mountain farm. No, what I've got is a strong back, that do ya? Oh, I couldn't ask better, could I? One side of Fraser's mouth curled up. No one end of a shovel from the other, do ya? That much I know. Then you'll do fine. Fraser shoved himself away from the doorframe. Claire's garden needs spading. There's barley to be turned at the still, and there's an almighty heap of manure waiting in the stable. After that, I'll show you how to milk a cow. Roger thanked him. Jamie lacked all subtlety in telling Roger Brianna and the baby would be alone for the night. Insert staring blue cat-like laser beams at Roger. <laughs> Without being prompted, he gave Roger relationship advice. 
I'm sure you will. Fraser's hand reached out and opened over the empty basin. There was a small metallic clink and a red spark glowed against the pewter. You'll mind I told you, Mackenzie. My daughter does not need a coward. Before he could reply, the brow dropped and Fraser gave him a level blue look. You've cost me a lad I loved, and I'm no inclined to like you for it. He glanced down at Roger's foot, then up. But I've maybe cost you more than that. I'll call the score settled. Or not, at your word. Astonished, Roger nodded, then found his voice. Done. That one sentence said it all. Brianna didn't need a cowardly man. Jamie told him to go for it tonight. There was no time like the present to convince her. Roger initially heeded Jamie's advice and went down to the cabin. He worked out ways to get her attention without scaring her because the windows were covered with they don't have with oiled skins because they didn't have glass windows so he she couldn't see him coming. It, the baby could be sleeping or any number of other things could be going on. Then he thought to give up and to try again in the morning. Jamie and Claire thus even in the advice taking. He stayed and walked around the cabin a couple more times. As if divine intervention, Brianna left the cabin to use the privy. He scared her, saying her name. She was annoyed and told him to go away. He waited for her to return from the privy. At first she chided him for walking on the foot before she told him to go back to bed. All right, he said and moved solidly into the center of the path in front of her. Where? Where? She froze but made no pretense of not understanding. Up there? He jerked a thumb at the ridge. Or here? I, ah, uh, be careful, her mother said. And my daughter does not need a coward, said her father. He could flip a bloody coin, but for the moment he was taking Jamie Fraser's advice. And damn the torpedoes. You'd said you'd seen a marriage of obligation and one of love. And do you think the one cuts out the other? Look. I spent three days in that godforsaken circle thinking, and by God, I thought, I thought of staying, and I thought of going, and I stayed. So far, you don't know what you'd be giving up if you'd stay for good. I do, and even if I did not, I know bloody well would I be given up by going. He gripped her shoulder, the light gauze of her shift coarse under his hand. She was very warm. I could not go and live with myself, thinking I'd left behind a child who might be mine, who is mine. His voice dropped a little, and I could not go and live without you. She hesitated, drawing back, trying to escape his hand. My father, my father's. Look, I'm neither one of your bloody fathers. Give me credit for my own sins at least. They are finally talking. That's so good. Hashtag on the train to communication station. Makes me happy when we get to this point. Did Frank Randall not love you as his own? Take you as the child of his heart, knowing you were the blood of another man, and one he'd good reason to hate? He took her other shoulder and gave her a little shake. Did that red-headed bastard not love your mother more than life and love you enough to sacrifice even that love to save you? She made a small choked noise and a pang went through him at the sound, but he would not release her. If you believe it of them, he said, his voice little more than a whisper, then by God, you must believe it of me, for I am a man like them, and by all I hold holy, I do love you. Slowly her head rose, and her breath was warm on his face. We have time, he said softly, and knew suddenly why it had been so important to talk to her now here in the dark. He reached for her hand, clasped it flat against his breast. Do you feel it? Do you feel my heartbeat? Yes, 
she whispered and slowly brought their linked hands to her breast, pressing his palm against the thin white gauze. This is our time, he said. Until that shall stop, for one of us, for both, it is our time. Now, will you waste it, Brianna, because you are afraid? No, she said, and her voice was thick but clear. I won't. Oh, and we all sigh so happily. Things are getting back in order. She invited him into the cabin after the baby began to cry. She laid down to nurse, and Roger sat on the nursing chair in front of the fire. The room was warm and had homey scents. He watched and apologized for it. She didn't care. To her surprise, Roger began to undress. What are you doing? Not fair for me to be sitting here gawking at you, is it? It's much less worth looking at, I expect, but... He paused, frowning at a knot in the lacing of his breeches. But at least you'll not feel your own display. Oh. He didn't look up to see, but he thought that had made her smile. He got his shirt off. The fire felt good on his bare back. Feeling unspeakably self-conscious, he stood up and eased his breeches halfway down before stopping. Is this a strip tease? Brianna's mouth quivered as she tried to keep from laughing out loud, joggling the baby. I couldn't decide whether to turn my back or not, he paused. Have you got a preference? Turn your back. For now. He did and got the breeches off without falling into the fire. Stay that way for a minute, please. I like to look at you. He's pretty fine to look at. I think Brianna's on to something. As I saw on Twitter today, it's a Roger Mack attack. Yes. Fine to look at. She asked about the marks on his back. The scars had come from the Indians. He turned around. It had been dark when they were together the many months back, so this was the first time she was seeing him in the light. Which of them had changed more since that first and only night together? He sat down and wanted to know what it felt like to have the baby nurse. To show him what happened when the baby nursed, she popped the baby off and sprayed him with the fine streams of let-down milk. Yes, Roger, just like a squirt gun. That's when breasts can do party tricks, ladies. <laughs> when the force of that milk, that rush happens, and the baby's gulp, 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 swallow, gulp, 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 swallow, before it's laced the nice, slow, long draws. We can do party tricks. We can squirt people in the eye, get it across the room. Oh, it's hilarious. Roger told her he wants her. She wanted him, too. Roger took the sleeping baby into his arms and looked him over. Brianna thought he was trying to see the resemblance. He wasn't. He wanted to have a proper look at the baby. Brianna brushed her hair while Roger examined the baby. He noticed the foot reacted to his finger stroke. I have put a link in here to baby reflexes when they're born and when they lose them. This is the Pupinski. You strike your finger, stroke your finger along their foot and their, and their toes will stretch out or they'll curl up. It's pretty fun. I have to do this when I do a newborn exam. I check the baby's entire reflexes. She explained the eau de baby scent that babies have. It is intoxicating and helps keep parents from killing them. She's not wrong. Babies are tough work. <laughs> I think many of us would put them for Spartan training up on the hill. <laughs> Brianna placed the baby back in the cradle. Now, during all of this, Roger is buck naked. <laughs> so if you think of this 6'3 man, yes, being just buck naked in this small cabin, there you have it. It's kind of all right there in your face. 
Roger asked why Brianna stayed once she found out she was pregnant. She couldn't leave without him. That's it. She allowed her gown to fall to the floor. He saw her in full nakedness. He delighted at seeing the colors upon her nether region. He wanted her. She wanted to know what Roger found holy. Their little family, nothing more. <sighs> so this is left for us to decide whether or not they were intimate or not. We don't rightly know. I have a feeling they may have been... Well, at least they made out. I don't know. Snuggled. But they're both totally buck naked. And there's nobody else there. I don't know. Well, I'm glad he took Jamie's advice and wasn't a coward. But I also think that Claire meant for him to be careful in the way of being sensitive, paying attention, listening, being direct but not being, you know, forceful. And it had to be a study in getting to know each other again and to get comfortable. And neither of them is the same. I mean, we have Brianna's abuse right in front of us, right? We know that she had been raped by Stephen Bonnet, even though he didn't see it that way. And... But Roger was beaten. He was abused. He was a slave. And they meant to kill him, most likely. And probably because the women had started fighting over him. There would be discord in the tribe if more than one woman wanted dog face, right? So Roger's been through a lot himself. Living a history is a lot different than knowing history. I sit there and I think about how we live now just in the context of my own 51 years, the things that I've seen. It's remarkable. More people have mobile phones, cell phones in this country, in the United States, than have flush toilets. Now, I want you to, like, think about that for a second. We have these little computers in our hands that we can get information from around the world, about the whole world, on our fingertips. We can talk to friends that live everywhere. I mean, I use social media to talk to friends that live in so many different countries. And we take that for granted now. I mean, jeez. Air travel was not even totally accessible when I was a kid yet for most people. And that was in the late 60s, early 70s. People still lived where they were born. I think even now that's the case. The vast majority of people live within 50 miles of where they were born. They don't see things. They don't travel. It's, you know, fairly easy to travel now. Whether it's road trips, we have nice roads, most of, you know, for the most part around this country. But how we live, we have dishwashers, we have washing machines for our clothes, heck, we have dryers for our clothes, we have vacuums we plug in to suck up the dirt. We go to drive to get our car washed and drive, and you just drive it through. We don't have to walk everywhere generally, or ride horses, or even ride bicycles. And if you live in a city that has good public transit, there you have it. You can still get there quickly, for the most part. So the way we live is so vastly different but I don't think that people are that different. I think all the things around us, all the technology, all the information is evolving quicker than we can 
like we're adapting to its use because we're the most adaptable creatures on the planet, I think, besides maybe cockroaches and birds, chicken, anything that are considered dinosaurs. <laughs> They just keep on, but we adapt and keep building on what we already know. I can't imagine, but things are very physically easy for us now. I think they're more emotionally stressful and that's causing a lot of our diseases and things, but Anyway, I'm very glad that Roger and Brianna got to this place. But that poor guy, seriously had some trauma too. And I don't think we adequately get to talk about that. But through this, we're really going to see Roger's heart and his strength and what's important to him and what sticks out to him as being necessary. I mean, Frank totally prepared Brianna for this. He taught her how to hunt. He taught her how to do so many things. And Roger's totally ill-prepared. He's completely academic, but yet... He's learning, and he will learn. And so Jamie says that he's mad at Roger because he had to give up his nephew, young Ian. Uh, I still think there's more to it than that. Maybe I'm just too much of a, I want to know all the layers and pieces, and sometimes a chair is just a chair. <laughs> it's not symbolic of anything. What do you think? Anything else about Jamie and Roger that you would like to add? And it's interesting how Claire was part of these chapters. She seemed to be almost on the periphery. And her one major thing that she did was give him advice and also to have Brianna help with the surgery. Because he really didn't need her to be there. But... That was her subtle manipulation for good, <laughs> which I like. I think Roger shows some pretty great restraint, and he's very bold. He's the exact opposite of being a coward. He showed up, and his first act was to have Jamie cut him so he could do a blood oath in front of witnesses to claim that child regardless. And it comes down to, again, him asking, like, Jamie gave you up and your mother up because of love, because he knew it was the right thing to do. And Frank loved her as his own, knowing she was the blood of someone else. I mean, he could see it in her face every day. So why does everybody think Roger couldn't do it? Does Brianna think she couldn't love another child, someone else's child? As her own, if she would become a stepmother? I, I think these are oft erroneous worries. As we've talked about over and over and over, is that people have been adopting children since the beginning of time. Children have always needed families to go to. People have married and blended their families because it was the best thing. And part of me could be romanticizing it, but I don't think so. I mean, I was part of a step family, and it wasn't good, and I wasn't treated well, and there was abuse. But it wasn't because I wasn't her kid even though she could see my mother's face all the time on me and she was jealous. I don't know why. But it's because she had been abused by her natural father. Her stepfather was a gem to her. But 
she still perpetrated that and she married an abuser and my dad. So I think it was much more than simply being a step parent. But no, did she love us the same? No, she didn't. And her mother and stepdad didn't love us the same either. Like, even though she had a stepfather who loved her as if she was his own, he didn't accept us the same. Her mother didn't either. And she didn't. So maybe it is a valid question and I'm... <laughs> Um, I keep coming up of, can you love somebody who's not your own blood? Well, I know I can. Like I said in one of the last episodes is that if I'm friends with you long enough, you either become like family or you move further out in the rung and just become a simple acquaintance. I, you know, could adopt people into my fold anytime. It's very easy for me to do that. But I think it's because of the situation I grew up in where I didn't feel loved and wanted by a whole bunch of people that I spent 20 years of my life with. And we had a family situation happened where blood was thicker than water and I got left out in the breeze in my mid-20s. So though I still know all of those people who I once called family, they're not family anymore. They, they chose, they chose blood because of blood, not because of good, right things. So maybe these questions are valid that Diana keeps bringing up. I just invalidated my own <laughs> thought process here. Hmm. I do love the part that Brianna and Roger just stood there naked in front of each other. They never got the chance to do that. I mean, just because they had sex, what, four or five times in that 10-hour period, eight-hour period, whatever it was. And yes, that is possible in the beginning. I still don't know how she didn't get a UTI, though. <laughs> I do, like I explained to you before, we do know how she got pregnant. If it's Rogers, how she got pregnant. Oh, biological imperative is strong. Anyway, I appreciate you waiting the extra week for the episode. As you can hear, my voice still is not very strong. This is the longest I have spoken in the last week. I was unable to record last week because I was coughing so profusely and my voice was squeaks and pops. It would have sounded like I was a teenager going through the change of voice. <laughs> and you would not have been able to listen to it at all. It would be horrendous. So I'm glad I could record today. Every once in a while, I get a bad enough cold that it affects my throat and there's nothing I can do about it. I do all the, the good hippie things, but it has to run its course ultimately. So the next episode, 34, that's our last one of Drums of Autumns. We have come to the end. We've spent 34 episodes together. That is tremendous. That's, what, two-thirds of a year almost? <laughs> 34 weeks. Wow. Yeah, that's about two-thirds of the year. So... You have spent a tremendous amount of time with me going through these, and I just appreciate you coming along, following along, sticking by, um, and I'll just ask you to help out the podcast by sharing it, by going into Apple Podcasts through iTunes and rating it. Every five-star rating helps people find my podcast, A Dram of Outlander. Join the Facebook group. We have about 1,100 of us now. And there's such good interaction going on. And I'm just going to give a shout out to Patricia and Jan. Thank you, as ever. Because they've really helped on the A Dram of Outlander community page in order just to keep the discussion going and bring different perspectives in, which I really appreciate. I can only do so much myself. 
And also, Jan is going to be writing blog posts for the website, since I've been focusing on the podcast portion and not writing as much material. So she's going to be doing something maybe once or twice a month, and the first one will be up this week. Super exciting. It's our way to kick off September. And you can also follow the A Dram of Outlander page. The website, of course, is adramofoutlander.com. My email, if you want to send me any comments, questions, thoughts, wag your finger at me, contact at adramofoutlander.com. I know, it's so shocking, right? And then the telephone number, if you want to leave a voicemail, is 719-425-9444. You can also leave a review on Google Play or Spotify. But just take a minute of your time and it will completely help me out for you to leave a review in any of those places. Lastly, the way that you can help out is financially. I just do this all by myself. All the front end and back end and upkeep is mine. You can go to patreon.com slash a dram of Outlander and do a monthly offering. It can be as little as a dollar a month. Or if you can do a one-time offering, then just throw me an email or a voicemail and I will tell you how to do that. But I appreciate every dollar. It totally helps. (laughs) It takes a fair bit to maintain everything. And, oh, I just had the thought of the new clip that Stars Outlander put out, or Outlander Stars, and at the end it had that beautiful view of Jamie and Claire standing and looking out over the mountains of North Carolina. They're supposed to be at the ridge. Well, we know they've only filmed in Scotland, so it's going to be some camera trickery and filtering. But whatever, it looks amazing. I don't know about you, but when I found out that there were people who were complaining that it was only Jamie and Claire in the poster, I was just, wah, wah, really? They are the main characters. It's their story. Then Diana Gabaldon actually says it's Jamie's story, ultimately, when the, when it all comes to a conclusion. I'm just going to st- stick to my own filter that says it's Jamie and Claire's story. But people were annoyed that it didn't have Rolo and young Ian and Brianna and Roger and name you else, whoever else would be there. <laughs> I was like, really? You know, have... why are you complaining? So people have the right to complain if they want to. But I'm curious if you found any issue with that. I thought that Brave New World poster is amazing. It's so beautiful. And Jamie's hair looks a lot better. The wigs last season, I just pretended they didn't exist. I didn't comment on it much, but, oh, not good. So his hair looks better, which I'm thankful for. And they have this show of strength with each other holding a hand, and it's just amazing. So I really liked it. Have any of you gone to any of the conventions uh, recently and met any of the stars? I know that Sam and Kat haven't been able to do everything because of shooting schedules, etc. So I would still like to hear your stories on who you've met and what they were like and what was the most fun and all those things. Again, contact at adramaoutlander.com and 719-425-9444. Okay, so we're marching to the end. One more stop on the Drums of Autumn train. And until next time, Slangeva.